Hi, it's Ross Pluskin here from the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. The fish that you see right beyond my finger represents a significant milestone in the maturation and the future sustainable dawn of the reef aquarium industry. The fish you see is a sustainably aquacultured green mandarin dragonet. Now, the mandarin dragonet has been historically one of the fish that has been considered very difficult for the old reef aquarium industry to keep alive, happy, and healthy, but it's also one which the new aquarium industry of the future is now having increased large-scale success with, and more importantly, can now produce sustainably farmed individuals that are born with the destiny of being able to survive and thrive in captivity in the reef aquarium environment. So today, on a running series, What is a Fish? We will be talking about the wonderful collective characteristics of this family, the Calliomyidae, the Dragonettes, the Scooter Blennies, and the Mandarin Dragonettes. And we'll be talking about how those biological attributes contribute to the, the challenges experienced by Aquarists of old, and how Aquarists of new, by appreciating those biological attributes, have succeeded with these fish to the point where sustainably aquacultured individuals such as this one can now be witnessed in a growing number of LFSs throughout the country and throughout the world. So, the Calliomyidae. Many people call them uh, a Dragonet goby or a Scooter Blenny, a Scooter Blenny. Um, these fish are neither members of the Blennyidae nor are they members of the Gobiidae. They are the Calliomyidae the Dragonets. They are their own entity. And that's very important to keep in mind because of the collective traits that makes a Dragonet a Dragonet. Now, a couple of things. One, we see highly specialized deliberation of fins here. The mandarin, like a seahorse or a pipefish, has highly modified fins for a relatively low flow environment. These originate mainly from the Indo-Pacific. They live in lagoons, flats, estuaries, and they thrive in areas of relatively low flow, maybe constant laminar flow, but think mud flat areas where they have areas of structure, there's lots of organics that settle down, and that means forage. So by having these specialized fins, the Mandarin Dragonet is specially evolved to navigate around every single nook and crevice of a coral, a rock structure, a piece of macroalgae. It's designed to be a microscopic assault helicopter that's going down using its specialized eyes and it's analyzing copepod, mysostrump, not lii, fish egg. And the second collective attribute of this family is that small specialized mouth, not too unlike that of a seahorse, that is used to couple up with those fins to navigate and those eyes to track down targets. And with that mouth and those fins, it can move in, boom, 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 boom. Every single target around it will end up inside that mandarin and end up being incorporated into its wonderful beauty and its coloration. Now, we can see two major challenges right off the bat. One, uh, many reef aquariums of old wanted to keep water quality as pristine as possible. They wanted to drop their nitrates, drop their phosphates, keep everything clean, power up the skimmer, load up the carbon. That doesn't necessarily work with these guys all that well unless you have a very well seasoned aquarium. That assault helicopter needs to be consuming hundreds if not thousands of prey items per hour. It needs to be in an environment where it can graze. It can hunt down a myriad of copepods, micro crustaceans, all kinds of things around it. Let's do a quick comparison gastrointestinally with that and our old friends of the Serenity. The Serenity, the groupers, big cardiac stomach. You can take in a single prey item, cook that down, be good for a few days. Not so true with the Calliomyidae. It must be constantly consuming prey items for its small cardiac stomach, so its intestine can rapidly be pushing through all that copepod forage. So we really need to be keeping this animal constantly fed. This was the second major pitfall of Aquarius when it came to trying to keep them in times past. They were dropping all their nutrients, they were increasing their filtration, they, God forbid, they were putting these fish in copper, there's no forage left for them to eat. Very soon, the mandarins would have a sunken belly, their, their gastrointestinal system would collapse, and soon the fish would promptly starve to death. A canary without any seed is one that beats a, a fast heartbeat and then stops. So, having acknowledged this, some people realized that others were having great success with mandarins, even quote-unquote dirty tanks. 
all the but people are like, well, Amanda is doing fine. It's just, it just grazes all day and it has a full stomach. It's because we realized how important all these micro crustaceans, these copepods and the like are to not only the functioning of our reef aquarium as a whole, but for being the routine forage of mandarins and other high metabolism fish. So since this was acknowledged, the reef aquarium industry has done things to acknowledge that nitrates and phosphates aren't necessarily boogish specters that need to be eradicated, but things that need to be converted into living food items that foragers can have access to. There was a greater tendency to treat a mandarin a lot more as a fish that requires what it needs. We are not keeping this fish in a copper fish only system. It is in an invertebrate system, constantly getting pulsed with all kinds of cold pods and everything else that's growing in this big, complex, rich, invertebrate rich tank of ours. Um, thirdly, we are now appreciating that these fish need to be directly fed and weaned onto frozen thawed foods as early as possible so that we can give them as many direct feedings to supplement that routine foraging of the tank. We've learned to embrace things like phytoplankton to dose routinely into tanks to boost pod populations. And as a manifestation of all this understanding, uh, I myself has been very fortunate enough to witness when I was studying at James Cook University in Australia, the green mandarin spawning in captivity. And it is a beautiful sight as the male and the female rise up doing their intraspiraling dance, crawling up like a DNA helix, and then poof, beautiful tufts of eggs and sperm making these microscopic emerald gems. And with the understanding of the biology of these gems and very careful techniques that have been embraced by companies like Biota and, and many others, these fish are now growingly available to be aquacultured from those eggs. And because of that, this fish right here does not have to be plucked from some random coral reef and completely divorced from all the forage that's experienced in the wild that could probably never be simulated properly in a tank. This fish was born in a tank. This fish was born and raised on a prepared formulation, both live and prepared foods that can be simulated and copied in its future home in an aquarium. For that reason, the green mandarin and other members of the Calumidae represent a transcending quality of the reef aquarium industry. To not only not give up when confronted with an obstacle and a difficulty, but to transcend and grow beyond and to be able to change our tactics and our appreciation of the biology of these organisms. And because of that, I get to look at a captive raised dragonette. One that will never know the shores of Indonesia or the Philippines. One which only knows Florida and the aquarium as its home. And that, in my opinion, is one of the greatest things the aquarium industry can do for any fish. Thank you, see you next time.